Well, good morning to you all. Good to see you leading up to Christmas. So we're going to uh, look this morning in Isaiah in um, some very uh, familiar promises that are there in the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> so we're going to start off with reading. Uh, so we're going to have a, a look at a couple of chapters um, couple of verses through Isaiah chapter 7, 8, and 9. So I'm certainly not going to read all of it, uh, but we're just going to pick out some verses from these chapters. So Isaiah chapter 7, 8, and 9, but we're just going to start off with reading uh, the first 17 verses in, well, not all of them, uh, in chapter 7. So chapter 7, starting at verse 1, when Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, uh, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so that the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. And then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son Shear Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the field of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, Be careful, keep calm and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram uh, and of the son of Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tobiel king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says, It will not take place, it will not happen. Uh, and verse 9, the last half of verse 9, If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. We'll stop there and let's uh, ask God's blessing on his word. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come and uh, think about the birth of your son, Jesus. Think about Christmas. Think about uh, the real meaning for the celebration that we have, for the carols that we sing, and for all that we do is centered on our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we can come and remember him this morning and think about this gift that was given to us, and we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, what I s read so far this morning doesn't sound very Christmassy, right? Uh, I'm sure you've been thinking. Well, there's a little bit more there uh, in chapter 7. But well, we start off here. Now, I want you to try and imagine. So there's Judah and Jerusalem, and then north of Judah is Israel, the divided kingdom. And then north of Israel is Aram or Syria. And then north, far north and up uh, to the east is Assyria. So don't confuse Syria and Assyria. So Syria here in this passage was called uh, Aram. And Assyria was the kingdom of Nineveh. The, the capital of, of Assyria was Nineveh. And right at this time, uh, Assyria was starting to really push out its boundaries. And it was becoming uh, a greater and, uh, and bigger empire. And it was starting to push out. And uh, very probably it was thinking about coming down and fighting with Egypt. And Egypt was to the south of Judah. And so where, where was Assyria going to come? It was going to come to Syria or Aram, and then it was going to come to Israel, and then it would be coming through Judah down into Egypt. And so the kings of Aram and the king and of Israel, they decided that really we need to have this... Uh, this uh, alliance to fight off the Assyrian Empire. 
And Judah, perhaps already, was flirting with uh, getting help from Assyria. And so Judah wasn't really keen to be in together with Israel and Aram. Because they thought, well, you know, we'd better make friends with Assyria. And so because they weren't really in this idea, Israel and Syria, or Israel and Aram, decided, well, we're going to punish Judah. We're going to put this guy to Beal as king. And then we'll have a larger area, we'll have an alliance, and we can hold off Assyria somehow. And so this is the situation that we're faced with. And uh, God wants to sort things out with the king of Judah, Ahaz. And so he sends Isaiah and he says, take your son, uh, Shear Jashub, and go out and meet him. And I want you to have a talk with him. And he brings this message and he says, you have to, whatever you do, you have to trust in God. Whatever you do, you have to stand firm. He says, this is not going to happen. This will not take place. Those two kings are not going to come down and destroy you. Stand firm. Don't be afraid. Trust God. And he says there at the end, the last words that we read, uh, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. And so Isaiah brings this message to Ahaz, the king of Judah. Stand firm. Trust God. Don't be shaken. Be confident in what God is going to do for you. But he didn't. Ahaz wasn't one of the good kings. He was going to do whatever he wanted to do and didn't matter what Isaiah said. He was more frightened of the king that was there. He was more frightened of Israel and Syria than he was worried about God. He was more worried, he, he was more willing to take the risk with Assyria than uh, worrying about what God had to say about this situation. And so in the end, what he did was he went to Assyria and he asked for help. And Assyria uh, later on came down and destroyed Aram, destroyed Syria, and destroyed Israel. And then it came in and destroyed most of Judah as well. And only Jerusalem was left untouched. And we come to that story later on with Hezekiah, the king. <clears throat> and so that's the situation. God has sent his messenger to Ahaz. Don't do it. Trust God. Don't go to Assyria. And Ahaz says, no, nah, it's too much of a risk. I've got to do the wise thing. We're going to go to the, the big power in this situation, and we're going to make sure that our safety is assured. So after this message that Isaiah brings to Ahaz, Isaiah brings another message, verse 10 of chapter, Isaiah chapter 7. And again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. It says, right, you have to trust God in this situation. So to strengthen your faith, ask God for a sign. It doesn't matter if the, it's the highest heaven or in the deepest depths. Anything you ask, I will show you that sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Very pious Ahaz. Suddenly he's getting all religious and pious. I'm not going to put God to the test. But in actual fact, if you look at what it means, putting God to the test, that is that when God shows you a sign, you don't believe him and you go and, and, and live by your senses anyway. In verse 13, then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. 
For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. So this morning, in these three chapters, as we look at them, the message that we're looking at is God says ask for a sign to Ahaz. We have to wait for a promise and we have to celebrate the fulfillment. Ask for a sign. Now I've got a subheading for that. It's a bit of a disappointing sign. And he says wait for the promise. It's a bit of a disappointing uh, promise. But then, all the disappointments gone, we can celebrate the fulfillment. <clears throat> so, okay, we looked at Assyria's the threat rising in the north. Syria and Israel are coming down to attack Judah. God tells Ahaz, don't depend on Assyria, depend on God. Don't go to the political solution, depend on God, trust in him. And he brings with him his son, Isaiah brings with him his son, Sheard uh, Jashub, which means a remnant will return. So God is bringing this encouragement. Well, a few of you are going to come back. Wow. That's a bit of a stiff encouragement. <clears throat> but God says, keep calm. Don't be afraid. Don't rely on Assyria because I am going to keep you safe. So Ahaz, he, as I said, he showed piety, but he didn't show any faith. He wasn't really trusting God. And so God says, right, ask me for a sign. And Ahaz says, no, not going to do that. And this is the sign. A young woman is going to have a son. And that son will be Emmanuel, God with us. Now, we know the further fulfillment of that. Matthew talks about it. But at the time, it was like, so what does that mean? A baby's going to be born? How is that a great sign? I mean, there are babies born every week, every month. You know, this is a big country. There are always, pe always babies being born. How is this baby a sign that God is with us? So... God says, you know, that's what the sign is. So at the time, the fulfillment at the time when Isaiah made that prophecy was a little bit, to me, underwhelming. <laughs> Babies are born all the time. How is this baby different? And that baby wasn't different. We look in chapter 8, and the baby that was born in chapter 8 becomes a sign of judgment. Mahashal al-Hashbaz. Swift to the spoil. There's going to be spoil and plunder. And it's actually the sign of God being with them was that there was going to be judgment because they refused to trust him. And so God gives a sign, and it's a bit of a disappointing sign. Yes, God is going to be with them, but as we look in chapter 8, the immediate fulfillment of that sign that God gives is a sign of judgment. And the baby that was born before he was old enough, uh, those two nations, Israel and Syria, were destroyed. But Assyria hadn't been destroyed, and now it was right on their doorstep. And Assyria, who Ahaz turned to for help, became a sign of judgment. So first of all, God said to Ahaz, ask for a sign. And then we have to wait for the promise. And I want you to think about this king, Ahaz. You know, there'd been a, a line of, of reasonable kings in Judah for that time. There was Uzziah, who started off well, well, had a bit of a problem at the end. And then there was Jotham. And then there was Ahaz, who was a really wicked, evil king. And then after Ahaz, his son Hezekiah was quite a good king. He, he started off well had a bit of a wobble at the end. <clears throat> when you look at the kings of Israel, they were also a sign. God had promised 
Remember way back in the Garden of Eden, God had promised uh, Adam and Eve that there would be a son who would save, who would bring salvation. So God promised a boy, a child. And then through the years, the years went past, and God said to Abraham, through you all nations will be blessed. And it narrowed down to Abraham. And then we, through the years it came to David, that God promised to David, you will have an everlasting kingdom. That your line, there will always be someone on the throne. Now I want you to think about that line of kings. Was David a good king? Yes, he was. Started off really well. Did he do good things all the time? No. Committed adultery and then committed murder to, to save his skin. And then his son Solomon. And then things started getting worse. And if you go down through the line of children from, uh, of kings that were born to David's line, they just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And so where was this everlasting kingdom going to come from? You know, this promise that God gave, first of all to Eve and then to Abraham and then to David, coming down through the line, it was starting to fade away into a bit of a disappointment. And the whole story of the Old Testament is waiting for a king, a king like David, but better than David, a king who is going to live forever and rule forever, a king who is going to be righteous, a king who is going to save his people. And yet, David, Solomon, down through the line, Uzziah, who ended up as a leper punished by God, Ahaz, who was an evil, evil king. And all through the Old Testament, the people are waiting for the Messiah. Remember, Messiah means the anointed one. Remember, I don't know if you remember when uh, David was being hunted by Saul and uh, Saul was attacking him in the cave and David had a chance to kill him. And he said, no, I'm not going to kill the Lord's anointed. That's that word Messiah with a small n. Saul was God's anointed one with a small n. David was God's anointed with a small n. Ahaz, in a way was God's anointed king with a small n, small n. And all of them were failures. All of them were disappointments. And down through the years, the promise was fading away and getting blacker and darker and more grim as the kings got worse and worse and worse. Where was the promise coming to? And the story of the Old Testament is looking for a king like David who was going to live forever and fulfill the promises and save his people. And so then we turn to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to skip over chapter 8, but there's a child born in chapter 8. There's a child promised in chapter 7, a child born in chapter 8. And then in chapter 9, we start to break through into clear light. Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee by the nations, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulder, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne, 
and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with righteous, with justice and righteousness. And from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So first of all, we have this baby who was born immediately, pretty, pretty soon, a few years after, or within a year of Isaiah's prophecy to Ahaz, and he was just a baby, but he was a, a, a sign of the promise to come. And then we have a baby born in chapter 8, who is a sign of judgment. And then, in chapter 9, we again hear about this baby, and this time, this is not a baby who is going to be born right there and then, but this was a baby who was going to be born from the line of David, who really was going to fulfill those promises, who really was going to bring all those things. And he wasn't going to be a sign of God being with us. He really would be God with us. He would be Emmanuel, God with us. You know, Ahaz was a wicked king. He was a terrible disappointment as the son of David. He, had, he refused to trust God. He refused to live in the light of the promises that God gave him. He was going his own way and he disobeyed completely. And yet, in that time of sin and disobedience and darkness and a refusal to obey and trust God, God gives this amazing promise. No, someone will come. A baby will be born who himself will be God with us. He'll be the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And of the increase of his reign, there will be no end. He will go on forever and ever. That promise was not given when Ahab was, Ahaz was obedient. It was not given when he was turning towards the light. It was given after he had disobeyed, after he had refused to trust God. At that time when things were at their very blackest, God comes and gives this promise. No. The son of David will not just be a human child, but he will be God himself. This Messiah who is coming is not going to be a small M Messiah. He's going to be the Messiah, the anointed one of God. Messiah with a capital M. Jesus, the one who is going to be God himself. The everlasting father, the wonderful counselor. Everything, the whole fullness of the Godhead would be in him and demonstrated to us. And so we can turn over uh, from this prophecy to what it says in Matthew. And so in Matthew chapter 1, the angel comes. And in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18... Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. And when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. God had promised all those years ago to Ahaz, not to a righteous king, to a wicked king, not to a king who is trying to please God, but to a king who is going his own way, not to someone who is living in the light of the trust in God, but to someone who is disobedient, because God was going to bring his judgment, but in bringing his judgment on Ahaz, he wanted him to know that there was going to be a light. And so that prophecy in chapter 9, uh, Isaiah tells them through God, a light is coming to this land that's in darkness. Galilee of the Gentiles 
is going to know the glory of God. God's presence is going to be with us. And he is going to deal with our sin. He is going to save us from our sin. And he is going to uh, change us from within. And so as we come to Christmas, let's remember, this is not just a baby is born. This is not just, you know, uh, a baby in a manger. This is not uh, carols and, and angels in the light. This is a story about our saviour coming to die for us, coming to live for us, to be our saviour and our messiah, to be our Lord and our king, to be the promised one who is going to fulfil all of the promises of the Old Testament, all of the longings, all of the waiting, all of the wishing for something that was better is going to be fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as that baby was born there in Bethlehem, it wasn't just a human baby, but this was God himself come to live with us so that we might know God and that our sin could be defeated. So it's not just a story of a baby, it's a story of a baby who came to die on the cross for us. Our saviour come to live his life so that we could be redeemed, so that we could live for eternity in fellowship with God. We can praise God for all that he's done and remember that he did all of this when the things were blackest. As it says in Romans, just when everything was at its worst, God sent his son to die for us. When we were his enemies, when we were the worst and far away from him, he sent Jesus to die for us so that we could live with him for all eternity.